the world does not want Iraq to fail and collapse, but they know we got to bring the troops home from Iraq. And, and I'll tell you, we have to do it not just because it's the right thing to do for them, it's the right thing to do for us. We've got a badly strained military. We've got young people that have done three, four, five tours. It's led to family breakups and child abuse and all kinds of horrible problems. And all these wounded veterans in mind and body. And we need a strong military. We can't rebuild it if we keep stretched out over there. And we've got problems in Afghanistan and challenges in Pakistan and all these things all over the world. The next president has got to figure out how to do this. Now that is the job of the next president. Fix the financial system, restore the economy, restore America's standing in the world. Now, if you say that's the job, it's obvious who the president should be. And I say that as a person who's made some of my fellow Democrats mad in this election season because I can't hide the fact that I both like and admire John McCain. And you should too. Ask yourself this. Could you spend five and a half years in a POW camp being regularly tortured, having your arms broken so bad you can't lift them above your shoulders and get out and be as productive as he has been and as good a citizen as he has been for as long as he has been? That's a pretty impressive thing. I also think, I also think from the stuff that he knows he's been willing to take on his party. He knows about torture, so he knew President Bush was wrong on that. Right? He knew that we were putting our own soldiers at risk. He had two years to learn about climate change, and he and Hillary hauled reluctant Republicans all over the world to show them how the globe was changing, and we had to do it for our kids and grandkids, and we should honor him for that. But on the job definition today, if you watch those debates, you know that Barack Obama has a better economic plan, a better health care plan by light years, a better education plan, a Republican streak. One of the things I, I want Senator Obama to do is to pull his, fill his commitment to involve Republicans in his government. I had a Republican Defense Secretary who did a terrific job. And I said, you know, why don't we have to have a partisan fight about what's good for our country on this? And we got a good we got a good Republican Defense Secretary now, by the way. He's the best guy that President Bush has had involved in this national security stuff since he took office. But I, I want that. But they've got to change their party more than they were willing to. They nominated John McCain because they knew he was the only Republican who had a remote chance to win, but they wouldn't cut him loose of all those bankrupt ideas that got this country in the ditch on economic and social issues and foreign policy issues. So there's a lot of Republicans up here. You should go out and tell them that. And don't say anything bad, but profess your respect for these people. We should not have to dislike people to vote against them when we think they're wrong. That's what it's crazy. Now, now, I want to tell you a reason you ought to be for Barack Obama that only I can tell you from my perspective. When you elect a president, normally you only get to see them make one presidential decision. Who's the vice presidential nominee? That's a presidential decision. If they win, it has great power and effect. Otherwise, the campaign's just worked. This time, you got to see them make two. What to do about the financial crisis? Because, to be fair to McCain too, if either one of them had bugged out, this thing might have come down around our ears. And it was popular at the moment to be against anything. But now look at the way Obama handled these things. I want to talk to you about them. I want you to think about them. Number one, he hit it out of the park with Biden. Hillary and I love Joe Biden. I know we're precious, but he's <laughs> Number, two. Number two, that decision looks much better today than it does the day he made it for a very simple reason. While the world will like Obama being elected, and they will think, oh, he's a citizen of the world in a way, 
The truth is, when he takes his hand off that Bible, taking the oath of office, he needs to go down to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, go in the Oval Office, shut the door, and get this country out of the ditch, right? <laughs> you would be mad if in the first month or two he was president, he went to Indonesia and drew a crowd of a million, and everybody was cheering and saying, come home, come home, we're in trouble, right? Even those of you who come here as a Turkish Americans for Obama side over there, I, uh, I think the, the importance of Turkey to our common future is one of the most underappreciated elements of America's foreign policy. And I want him to go to Turkey and do what I did, but not soon. We need him to go fix the country, right? America first. Okay. But it's not like we can walk away from the rest of the world. I'll just give you one example. I think in the first six months of next year, there is an enormous opportunity to get a breakthrough agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now, if that happened, it would take about half the energy out of the terrorism movement all around the world. Okay? So we can't just walk away. If you gave every member of Congress, Republican and Democrat, a secret ballot, so they wouldn't be out of it, and you say, just put down the three names of the people in the Congress that you think know the most about international economic, military, security, and political affairs, Joe Biden's name would be on every single ballot. Decision two, what to do about the financial crisis. So Senator Obama took some mild but some criticism, which was very rare because the press likes him so much, you know, and it's almost unheard of, for being kind of quiet the first day or two. But I knew what he was doing. First he got all of his economic advisors together, then he called all my economic advisors. Then he called me, he called Hillary, then he called all other people. And the first thing that was clear to me, he said, I want to understand this. How did it happen? What are the implications? What is going on? It is really complicated, unless you do this for a living. And I was thrilled. Why? Because the world is full of highly complicated problems, including the finance issue, the energy issue, and the health care issue here in America. And we need a president who wants to understand and who can understand. <laughs> then he did something that I liked even better. He called around and he said, okay, now what are we, I get it now, I got it, what are we going to do? And tell me what the right thing to do is. Don't tell me about the politics or what's unpopular or anything else. I just want to know what's best for America. I'll figure out how to sell it. And this may be an impolitic thing to say so close to the election, but I'm just telling you what the job's going to be like. This is not going to be easy, and you all know it, don't you? You all know it. You're going to have to give me some time and cut in some slack. This is a hard time to go. Okay, here's why that's important. When you have to make a complicated decision on a momentous matter and you have to do it in a hurry, the chances are far greater than 50% that the right thing to do will not be popular at the moment you do it. And we hire presidents to win for us, to win for our kids, to win for our future. And so the best ones in moments of crisis stand up and say, I know you may not like this, but here's why I did it and I am prepared to live with the consequences. I will bear responsibility if it doesn't work out, but if it does, that's what you hired me to do. And that's exactly the way he approached this thing. Just think, I mean, he'd have gotten a lot of people cheering for him and he'd say, this is ridiculous for us to allocate any financial resources to these financial institutions that ripped the American people off. But he knew the facts. The facts were that the Wall Street you're mad at no longer exists. There is not a single freestanding investment bank left on Wall Street. The two that survived have become bank holding companies, which means they have to keep more reserves and they can never engage in the kind of speculation that led us into this mess again. What he was worried about, once he understood it, 
he got it. You know, he was worried about the car loans, the refrigerator loans, the, the, the television loans, the 